Um, I'm Dobromir. Uh, I work at Telepart. Uh, I used to work at Telepart. Telepart's been bought by Twitter. Um, but everything we describe here is built by Telepart uh, when we were still an independent company, or almost, almost all of it. Um, quick background. Um, I was professionally before a salsa dancer and performer. If I do start dancing on screen, I apologize, uh, on stage, I apologize ahead of time. Uh, it's just hard for me to avoid uh, doing it. So, and if you guys want a free dance lesson after this presentation, if it's not very interesting and you prefer to do something different, I'm happy to do that as well. So, uh, tactical Mesos. Today we're going to talk about internet uh, scale ad bidding and how it works on Mesos and Aurora. So, before that, quick introduction about us. What is Telepart? Our mission is uh, fully automated. We do not like humans. Uh, smart, so great performance and ads performance matters. Uh, marketing platform, so taking your products, figuring out how to make ads out of them that make you a lot of money automatically. These are some of our customers. We sort of aim at the uh, top 200 uh, currently US only uh, retailers. We have about, uh, I think, 50 or 60 engineers and almost everything we're going to describe here was built by a team of like four or five. So our agenda, uh, we're going to talk about uh, scale performance, AWS, since we're obviously on AWS and Mesos on AWS is slightly interesting. Uh, and then something I call move up the stack, which I'll describe a little bit more later. So this presentation is going to be somewhat different, perhaps, from the other presentations uh, you guys have been going to. Um, in particular, we haven't built any schedulers. Uh, we don't build Mesos frameworks. Uh, we didn't build any RPC systems. We didn't build service discovery, right? Uh, we're a small startup. We don't have time to do crap like that, right? We actually have a business to run. Um, so what this talk is mostly focused on is why is a small company even deploy Mesos and Aurora? What do we get out of it? What were sort of the problems? Um, and what is sort of the value you deliver to engineers, right? So I think and I hope um, a lot of people out there are considering using Mesos Aurora, but don't really know, especially on AWS, why they should go use it. Uh, so I kind of want to talk about that. Quick show of hands, who here is uh, uh, on AWS? Uh, running Mesos or Aurora on AWS? Okay, so we'd love to see if this is uh, some of the same experiences you guys have had uh, going on to that. So what makes us interesting uh, and make, should make you put away your laptop or at least stop snoring um, is sort of our scale uh, and then also the fact that we try to build almost nothing, right, and just combine existing tools. So what are the real problems we had? Uh, this is sort of one of the real problems we have, right? Uh, problem, you might not be able to see the y-axis. It says 140 up there. Right now we're at about 200,000 QPS. We just added another 50,000 QPS in the last couple of days. Um, you can see we have large, large trials, right? So night traffic is almost uh, a fifth, or currently is probably closer to like a sixth or a seventh of daytime traffic. And our latency numbers are, that's at the bottom, 50th percentile. We're under 10 milliseconds. Um, and tail, tail, so like 99.99th is about 100 milliseconds, right? So this is what happens when you're bidding on online ad markets. Um, you have a lot of traffic coming through, and you have to respond very quickly. Almost all of the online networks give you about 100 milliseconds to respond. Time is very literally money. If you don't bid, you don't make money, right? The faster you bid, yeah, sometimes uh, you won't really make more money if you bid faster. It doesn't really matter. What matters is the amount of data you can crunch before you have to respond to your bid. Right? So when we were considering going to Mesos Neuro, and I'll talk a little bit later why we were even considering it, this was the first big question. It's like we couldn't really find anybody who had done very low latency uh, systems on Mesos. Um, it was hard to find people who had done something like that. So we are kind of curious, is it even going to work? Right? unlike this presentation, which is not working. Um, so that's sort of the, uh, the big question mark we had. And we sort of uh, subscribed to the philosophy of start with the hardest problem first, right? Prove it can be done. Uh, and if it can be done, then go solve the easy problems, right? Uh, do you know why it's flickering like that? Been doing that in here all day. Oh, so it's not me. OK, good. Um, sometimes I stress people and systems out, apparently. Right? Uh, so this was really the big question mark. Can you even do it? Um, and we had lots of debates. We're like, well, maybe we can go use Mesos, but like every, every actual bidder is going to run on a separate machine. And we're like, well, what's the, what's the point, right? It's like it's not really a deployment system. It's not the only thing it does. Um, so we're like, all right, well, we should really test this. This is one of the first things we should do. Let's go ahead and put bunches of bidders on, on individual machines and see what happens. Um, let's check it out. So here's a graph. This is, uh, this is March of this year. 
And what we noticed is that on individual instances, uh, CPU would go crazy uh, if there were two or more tasks on the same machine. Ouch. So this kind of hurt our, uh, our idea of we could actually co-locate. The problem was we'd actually been running for three months without a problem. So it's really mysterious. It's like, why suddenly does co-locating services uh, cause this problem? And after about a week of digging, you can see that, that graph is about a week long, we realized it's because we upgraded uh, kernels and it has absolutely nothing to do with Mesos at all. So before and after, I mean, we're running a lot of stuff on a single machine uh, with very low latencies. And as long as we never hit our CPU throttles, we have no problems whatsoever. This was very surprising to almost everyone at the company. We thought there would be all sorts of problems when we try to do this, almost none. So the second big question we had was, will we max out our NICs, right, our network cards? Uh, we run all sorts of different stuff. We have 500 megabytes per second of just metric collection. Um, we're running databases on this, right? Real-time bidding, obviously. We're like, how many different kinds of things can we put on here uh, that are very network intensive, um, and what are they gonna do with us? So this is also a big question mark. Um, I looked at this recently. We still have a lot of headroom. That's about a gigabit per second we're using on the max and sort of, uh, I think it's about 10, uh, 10 megabytes per second uh, average. Uh, on AWS, you can get to about 10 gigabit per second NICs if you need them. I don't think we're even using that because we're not on HVM. But we got a ways to go, and this is, move, this is with uh, databases and all sorts of stuff on a single machine, Elasticsearch, et cetera. So this was also something we did not have to worry about. So surprisingly, the, the whole performance issue, the thing we were most worried about, ended up not being a problem at all, right? It's kind of just worked out of the box. And that was probably the biggest surprise to us, and also sort of the nicest thing. So this is our world today. This is just a single machine I picked up today uh, before this uh, presentation. And you can see we're running four bidders on the one machine. We're running two Redis instances, uh, a FARS front end, that's one of our metric collection systems, identity service, that's one of our um, SOA things downstream, which I'll talk about later. We had Elasticsearch on there using a bunch of disk, and it just all kind of works, right? It just seems to be there. Uh, we run everything in Docker, so unfortunately Aurora is not very good at showing you the resources, but if you looked at this, a lot of these things are using like four CPUs and 10, 20 gigs of RAM and stuff, right? Um, so we're partitioning machines really, really nicely with this. So performance just kind of works, surprisingly. Um, this is what our infrastructure looks like right now. It's actually, this is probably already out of date. Well, we tend to launch microservices, seems like a couple times a day. Uh, it's one of the dangers of giving people an easy platform for microservices. They like to use them. So this is probably a little bit, uh, a little bit out of date. But what does online ad budding look like? You have a browser. There's an ad unit. goes to the ad network, which sends you a request saying, hey, I've got this user. How much do you want to bid on them? OK? Jumps into our ELBs, because we're on EC2. You run into this first problem, which I'll again talk a little bit more later. How do I go from an ELB into my Aurora or Mesos cluster? So we have this thing called OrProxy, um, which basically just listens to all the downstream things. It's Nginx. Uh, we have bidders right now, about 300 of them. And I think it's probably hard to see up in the corner. Uh, we are using about 1,200 cores and three terabytes of RAM for our bidders. Uh, the bidders themselves do multiple serial RPCs, right? So first, they jump to an identity service. The point of an identity service is to go, who the heck are you? I have a cookie ID. Cookie IDs are useless. I don't know who you are. OK, let me go down into my uh, Lambda-style architecture, SpeedDB and ServingDB. Let me go down and figure out this cookie ID. Who does it map to? Who are all the possible users you actually are? And what probability is it that you're actually a user? We get that back. Um, that should hopefully happen in orders of milliseconds. Uh, we then jump from that and say, your most likely user is X. We jump to the timeline service, which is, well, what have you recently looked at? Right? We need data in order to bid on you. So timeline service will give us maybe 10 to 100 kilobytes of data back, also going to two different databases. Right? So at this point, we've got one network hop, two network hops, three in parallel, four, five, six network hops, right? all happening. Um, Back to the timeline service with maybe 100 kilobytes of data that just pops it back up to the bidder, which now runs a bunch of different models on it. So hopefully at this point, we got maybe 10, 15 milliseconds in. We got a nice long 50 millisecond chunk if we wanted to, to do a bunch of modeling on top of uh, the user data we got back, run it across all of the different partners and customers we have in order to decide which ad is likely to make the most money for everybody involved. So this has now become more complicated because we're adding in a user service uh, and we're adding services all the time, right? We now want to make this as complicated as we can in order to make our machine as smart as possible. So we went from running all of this on clean AWS to running all of it on Mesos Aurora, probably about, oh, the first, first set of production traffic, it was less than six weeks, uh, real production traffic. 
we had all of our bidders moved over in less than, I think, three months. Um, and we had the entire system switched over, uh, including other teams bringing up moving stuff in less than a year. Right? So we did this on a relatively uh, aggressive schedule. Um, I'm not going to go too much into detail about how we did that. It's an interesting story of its own. Um, if you guys are interested and you are, have the same problem of having to move and how do you do it successfully and aggressively, very, very happy to talk about that. So um, one last thing is, of course, uh, you probably heard this from the Apple guys today, Mesos scales, right? This is super important. We've got hundreds of thousands of tasks. We aren't huge, right? I consider ourselves small to medium sized, um, but we're large enough that we're kind of worried about what is out there that uh, you know, won't fall over. Um, it was very happy to know that the Twitter, of course, is running at scales uh, hundreds of times larger. So that's sort of the performance story. The performance story is unfortunately kind of boring, right? It just kind of worked. That's good when you're trying to use technology, right? You don't want to have interesting performance stories. All right, next. So what's our AWS story? So I asked earlier who runs Mesos on AWS. Um, as a startup, this is really not an obvious decision. You're giving up a lot of great toys, right? ELBs, IAM, elastic IPs, auto scaling, like all the stuff that as a startup just kind of works. You don't have to think about it, right? So why would you do it? Well, I actually argue that you probably shouldn't. If you're a startup on AWS, switching to just using Mesos kind of doesn't make sense. Mesos doesn't give you enough, right? It doesn't really give you enough things, enough problem solving that makes sense to switch. And we didn't switch to just using Mesos. When we were looking around, we're like, we need more. What do we need? We need an entire microservice stack, right? We need RPC. That was one of the big ones, because we, you know, we couldn't find anything. We were trying HTTP at first. That didn't work. We did HTTP with Thrift. That didn't work. Then we did Thrift over TCP. That didn't work, right? We're like, we can't find anything that's actually performant enough, right? The only thing we finally landed on was Thrift Mux on Finagle, which could actually do the things we wanted. And we're like, well, this ties really nicely in a war with Aurora for service discovery, deployments, et cetera. Um, it, tw it goes ties in very nicely with Twitter server for monitoring, et cetera. We threw in Librato to get ourselves um, uh, dashboards and so on. So the reason we went off of just clean AWS is like we found all these things that AWS couldn't do at all. AWS had no solutions for it, right? And when we thought, well, we'd have to roll our own, we realized rolling our own there would probably be more work than switching the stack like this and rebuilding the things we lost from AWS. Right. So what do you lose? Well, ELB is one of the things you lose. And I claimed earlier we didn't really build anything, so I kind of lied. Right? We did build one thing, which is called Or Proxy, a very simple Nginx um, with, a, uh, with a little Python listener to your Aurora service discovery in Zookeeper, which will route traffic as your things come up. Right? So this is obviously the ingress problem. How do you get traffic from an ELB into your actual job? We had to build that. Um, at the end, if we have time, I'm happy to talk about a post-mortem we had from building this. This is why I hate building software, right? The worst software ever is the software you have to build. The best software is the software you never have to build, right? This is actually a good example. I mean, we needed it, we built it, it works, but, you know, we probably spent months more than we expected on this rather than just taking off the shelf components. Right now, we're building auto-scaling because we realized, well, okay, we're going to give it up. That's okay. It's just a cost issue, right? We can live without cost. Productivity is more important than cost. But as you get bigger and bigger, at some point, cost kind of catches up. And when your VP starts knocking, you kind of have to build auto-scaling. So we had to build our own auto-scaling system. Very, very simple. Um, I'll talk about it later. You can see this is graphs of the last couple days. Um, white is just the target size. Red is the uh, uh, ideal size. And then purple is sort of the current size. Right? So you can see how we're, we're scaling some of our systems. Um, since we don't like building stuff, because we've got more important things to do, um, there's a really simple approach we did this, built on top of the, uh, the infrastructure. I'll talk a little bit about that later. So Mesos plus AWS does, is nicer, I would say, than Mesos per se, just by itself. Why? Fungible resources, right? So it's, I come from a Google world, and for me, it took forever to understand that, in, in that when you're in AWS, you can think about the world differently, right? Like auto-scaling makes sense, and Google never made any sense at all. Um, and the whole point is fungible resources. So you can solve problems just differently than you would if you have a fixed, uh, fixed cluster size. One example of that is our database. So um, we built a database from scratch. I know, it was a terrible mistake. Actually, it works really well, and it took us three weeks. So it was not a terrible mistake. Um, but one of the things, one of the big problems when we had this database, uh, which is batch built, right? We need, we need a very, very high performance, but we also need something that every day we could roll out an entire new database built off of our MapReduce uh, cluster. We're like, well, how do we actually swap? Swap is a really difficult problem. 
Um, swap's one of the biggest problems in Google search, right? I can talk about that all day long. Um, AWS, it's really easy. It's like, well, I can just bring up more machines. So I'll bring up more machines, I'll throw a database on there. Once it's loaded, I'm gonna go on Zookeeper and flip a little flag saying switch. All my Finagle clients, which are sitting over there, all they have to do is switch from one namespace to another namespace. In fact, you just have two Finagle clients and you just swap out which one you use, and you've got a second database, right? So temporarily, for a very short period of time, you're using twice as many resources. You can see we're using two and a half terabytes of RAM and 15 terabytes of disk. Normally it would be half of that, right? Once we get rid of the cluster, tear it all down, it's gone. Right? What does uh, Mesos and Aurora give you on top of that? Really, really fast deploys. Right? So we can do a swap of a 15 terabyte uh, cluster. I think it takes us 45 minutes right now. And most of that's bringing up the AWS machines. Right? Cool, so that was a sort of performance and uh, in AWS. But as I mentioned earlier, we kind of reuse components, right? And I don't think it's really a good investment for startups time to work low in the stack. So what do I mean by move up the stack? Well, if you're working on Mesos frameworks as a startup, you're not really solving your users' problems, right? Like, your developers have more important things to worry about, and you should be helping them on the more important problems. So what does a service-oriented uh, architecture actually look like? What are the pieces, right? This is just a subset, the ones I could think of in the last you know, hour as I threw something together, right? There's overload, flags, configuration, load balancing, RPC, versioning, authorization, health, stack traces, right? There's all sorts of crazy stuff that goes into building a service-oriented uh, architecture. Mesos doesn't solve most of these. Aurora doesn't solve most of these. Finagle does not solve most of these, right? These are these little pieces. You have to find all the pieces and combine all the pieces, right? So we actually spent most of our time looking at how do we get the, the base in so that we can start building the really interesting stuff, the things that actually nobody has a solution for, rather than the 16 different versions and the question is, do I build the 17th because I want to get promoted, right? We didn't have time for that. So before I jump into a, sort of a graph of what we built, and I'm actually going to try and do a bunch of demos here um, so people can sort of see what uh, some of the things we've actually built. I want to talk a little bit of uh, theoretically real quick, which is this. Imagine that you know, you're working at a company like ours. Somebody's built a resource manager, hopefully Mesos. Somebody's you know, implemented a scheduler, hopefully Aurora. And you're the guy who's supposed to build auto-scaling. OK, it's pretty easy, right? All you have to do is uh, figure out what the APIs are into your scheduler so you can maybe take down some jobs when you know, the load changes. Hopefully, you have some load calculation mechanism already in place. It's not too bad. Now, what happens when somebody builds a different scheduler, right? And they're like, oh, actually, we're going to run this other scheduler on our Mesos cluster. Well, this other scheduler has a slightly different interface, right? So your autoscaler now doesn't work anymore. That's all right. Two schedulers is doable, right? You just go and you fix your autoscaler to now know how to talk to this other scheduler. But what happens when there's N of these, right? N different schedulers running on your cluster. Right? Or what happens when there's N plus one because somebody can add a new scheduler whenever they want without even talking to you? Right? What does your autoscaler do? How does it even know how to reduce the number of tasks that are running or how to free up resources? It can't. Right? You actually can't keep up with it. Right? And this applies not only to autoscalers or schedulers. It applies to like almost every piece of a stack. Right? Like configuration. Well, if you have n different configuration systems, how do you actually tie them together so when something changes here, it changes over there too? Right? Well, you have to understand all the different configuration systems. It becomes the complexity becomes very, very, uh, very bad very quickly. Right? So one of the things that we've really pushed for from the beginning is one way to do things, right? And I'll branch to anybody who wants to listen to me that I think to, that multiple schedulers is usually a bad thing, right? I like to avoid having multiple schedulers on my cluster whenever possible because as soon as you start changing the bottom of the stack, that means it bubbles up. And every piece on top of it, which had all these assumptions, whoa, all these assumptions it could live with, and go, hey, I can assume that I have this, therefore I can now do cool stuff on top of it, all those assumptions break, right? And suddenly you're rebuilding at the bottom of the stack crap that you really don't want to spend time on because you want to be working up the stack, right? So let's see if we can jump into this picture here. All right, so we pulled this together earlier today, right? So what is this? This is actually us going through sort of every single thing that we use and everything we've built and everything that our users care about. And obviously, we missed a bunch because we spent about 10 minutes of it during lunchtime. But this is how I think the world actually looks like. And let's actually start at the bottom here, right? So this is easy, right? 
you need to make money as a company. You need to survive. Right? This is what the market cares about. The market cares about are you making money or not. Simple. All right, so what does your management care about? Well, hopefully your management's a little bit smarter, and they realize that you know, in order to make money, you have to have fast iterations and probably some product stability, and probably your compute has to be pretty cheap. Maybe you need some security over here, right? So blue is kind of like what your management cares about. And then you got kind of orange, and orange is what your developers care about. They're like, well, if I need to iterate quickly, I need debugability, I need develop environments, I need logs, local development, monitoring, blah, 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 blah. You can do this all day long, right? It's like, all right, well, what are the pieces that actually exist today that you can just implement? Pink. That's not that much, right? Whoa. So we use Java, which gives us Twitter server. And what the arrows here are really saying is you can't have the piece below it, what it's pointing at, without having the pieces above, OK? So if you want debugability, well, you need like logs. Okay, well, in order to get really easily accessible logs, we need Aurora, right? Aurora is our way to get logs. But to use Aurora, we need to use Mesos, right? Well, for example, if you want lo local development, well, we need Docker to get your local development. Now, let's go to something really complicated here. We want it auto push, right? Like, code just goes to production, no work required, right? It just goes out magically. Well, shit, that's really hard, right? In order to get auto push, well, I need to be able to build my stuff, right? So I need some sort of development environment, I need a push system. I need a configuration system flags. I need a monitoring system so I can tell when things go bad. I need some sort of low test system so that I can actually send load and check if things work. Well, if I have a low test system, I need an RPC system in order so it knows how to talk to each other. I need somewhere to get logs. So I need binary logs, but to have binary logs, I need to have some way of generating these binary logs. So I need to have a standard server, blah, 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 blah. It's like just cascades, right? So building an auto push system, when you have one way of doing all of this different stuff, isn't hard, right? It takes time, but you just kind of go and implement it. And you say, OK, I've got all these pieces. Try building a load test system if you have two or three or four different RPC systems, right? Or four different service discovery systems, right? Or I don't know, God forbid, like you've got three deploys. Or every team deploys differently. Like, how are you going to auto, how are you going to build one auto push system which says, hey, you create a new service, click of a button, you have a service, it runs, it auto pushes. Well, oh, I don't know how you're deploying. I can't do that. Right? Pick one of 16 deploy options. Doesn't work. Right? So in order to move up the stack and do the more interesting problems and get, make your developers much more productive, you kind of have to have these assumptions things are below are standardized, right? which means you really want to have just one or maybe two. The Google joke always goes is the deprecated one and the one that not, that's not ready yet. Right? So you might want to have two. But you really don't want to have more than two ways of doing things. Right? So, what did we actually build? The gold stuff is sort of the things we built because it just doesn't exist yet. Right? And it makes me sad that we're building this, right? Because our job is to go freaking be the smartest people about what products we should show to what users. That's what we should be doing, right? That's what our business is all about. Does any of us do that? No. Right? This is overhead. All of this is overhead. Right? We have teams of like a dozen people doing stuff that's overhead because it doesn't exist out there. Or when it does exist out there, it exists in 16 different ways, and therefore it doesn't exist out there. Right? Coming from Google, one of the things that for me is just it makes me so angry is open source software does everything differently. Right? There's no RPC system that every single open source package uses. Of course not. Right? And it's incredibly frustrating as an operator. Because you go ahead and try and deploy this into your, you know, your nice system where you're like, everything runs the same, and then you're like, oh, wait. Yeah, I can't actually uh, give you a connection to that because it has some totally different RPC system, and so I can't even monitor it, right? So what we've kind of done in those cases, and I'll, I'll give you some examples, but we, we kind of try and bury those behind, pretend that they're our system and bury them behind like facades so people can't actually realize that they're our system, but generally it, uh, it slows everybody down and makes people angry. So that's the picture. Before I jump into some demos of, what, of the stuff we've done or description of the stuff we've done, any questions? Is this your guys' experience, too? Yes? Yeah. Lots of nodding of heads. All right. How do people actually moving up the stack, though? Like, is consistency in the development environment a real thing, or is it the exception, not the rule? It's the exception. Big time. So I'm really curious how people fight it, because it's also something we have to fight quite actively. And I guess the way we fight it is we basically have a team of people who just constantly go around refactoring people's stuff until it's consistent. <laughs> Which is, not, which is not great, but it's kind of worked so far. It works if you're 50 people. It doesn't work if you're more than that, right? Yep. 
Yep. How, how do you try, how do you get I'll just fire them. That's the easiest way. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, we would have no developers either. Uh, yeah, one of the biggest problems we had, especially when we had just Mesa Aurora, was the pushback. Right? It was the, this is not what we want. We don't have enough control. Right? Blah, 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 blah. Um, probably I approached it the wrong way to begin with, because I approached it the Google way. The Google way is the stick. Uh, sort of uh, the, the culture at Google is always, you are always migrating to the new thing, and tough luck, just do it. Um, so I assume that that's how the rest of the world worked. Uh, it does not, <laughs> as I found out the hard way. Uh, and the, I think our CEO has a great way of putting it for customers. He says, love in, not lock in. Right? Is figure out a way to make people want, want it. Um, and I think the most successful thing we end up doing is a few of us uh, early on would just build, build a new system, probably help one of the bigger and sort of more visible customers get in there. Um, I spent personally two months just working on the bidder, which was like, I never worked on the bidder before. I have no idea what it is. All I did for two months was work on the bidder and make it work in our system. Right? There's a whole bidder team, and they're like, we don't care. We're not doing it. I'm like, all right, that's fine. I'll just do it. I just did it. Once it was in there, once they started seeing it, they're like, oh, yeah, that's kind of nice. Right? And I'll show you the things that you know, they looked at that they were like, that's kind of nice. Um, it probably took us a good six to nine months before nobody even remembered the old way of doing it. And they were just like, oh, yeah, well, I'm going to do it this way because it's so easy. Like, why would I do it differently? Right? But very much as you have to keep giving them features. That's another reason I, re I really push moving up the stack. Because right? if you just give them this kind of foundation, and they go, well, I could deploy using Mesos, and I have to probably build a framework, or I could have my fab files. You know, it's really not that different. Right? Maybe there's this theoretical cluster utilization thing, but I don't care as a developer. Right? I don't see it. Right? But as you move up the stack, and you give them more and more value adds on top of the infrastructure, and you're like, hey, by the way, if you use our system, you can have a new service with a click of a button, which is what Tony built. Like One command, you have a new service with like APIs. You get a dashboard for free. You have UIs for it for free. You've got a load test tool for it for free. Right? And it's like, wait, I can get all this stuff for free? Why would I do it any other way? Right? I think that's the goal you have to get to. It takes a lot of time. And we're still working on it. Right? Like the, whole, the whole white stuff over there is stuff we still haven't built. Right? We gave up IAM. Uh, and authentication, encryption, authorization. We gave all that up, and we still don't have a solution for it because there's nothing in the open source world for this. Right? So we're like, all right, we have to go talk to the Finagle team and see if they're building it, or we have to build it ourselves. We really want to avoid doing that. Right? Other questions? Yeah, it's probably more now, but. Yep. Yeah. It's... <laughs> um, yeah, that's a good question. That was that was another one of my first projects was trying to rip out our backend and replacing it with Libretto, um, and I ran into the same problem of forcing people doesn't work, uh, love and not lock in. Um, so the answer there is actually twofold: is we still have our own. I'll describe that in a second. Uh, but the majority of engineers now use Libretto, um, and we're basically pushing all of our data into Libretto. Um, why is it so much data? Um, I'd say that's cultural, probably more than anything else, right? Instead of having a, a whitelist approach where if you want to monitor something, you specify, I want to monitor it, right? We have the blacklist approach, or actually the no list approach of, you know, you write one line of code and suddenly you're, you know, hitting 10 megabytes a second of data being pushed on the wire to, you know, to somebody else. Um, and again, this is kind of, we've kind of compromised, I think, and we've said we want our developers to feel comfortable in the system, so we're not going to change the culture too much. Uh, and so instead, we're going to page our developers. I think I got paged for this last night. We're going to page our developers once from time, from time to time, when the developer does something stupid and exports, you know, 10,000 variables per second extra or something. Um, and it's been okay. It's not great. Um, I think if we were building from scratch, you would probably take a different approach. Um, the internal system uh, called uh, we call it VARS. I think was it open source? Uh, it's. Uh, Taba. We actually think of it on uh, Telepart as Taba. It's a Python metric collection system, um, basically agents running. There used to be agents running in every machine. When we moved to uh, service-oriented architecture, we started doing it over the network. Right? We just have an agent pool running. And one of the first objections was, this isn't going to work. Agents have to run on the machine. It's not designed to be a, uh, a service. It turned out that switching it to a service was not that bad. It actually wasn't that much work. There was, there's actually a, an interesting outage story from that as well. But it wasn't horrible. It worked. Um, and so then there's like two layers of, you know, you collect all the things by machine, and you aggregate, and then you push it down, and you re-aggregate, and you push that down to, I think, I think it stores stuff in Redis, right? Yeah. Yep. For a team with limited resources that has embraced Mesos and the world as you have, uh, would there be any other public cloud uh, that would give uh, comparable features you need uh, besides AWS? 
um, would be in your public cloud. Um, I'd say I, I'm not super familiar with other public clouds. I'm a little bit familiar with GCE. Um, I'm very familiar with what Google has internally, but none of that's available. None of the cool stuff is available on GCE, right? Um, and I haven't looked at other clouds. But my, my understanding is that, so what was our limiting factor? RPC, right? I'd say more than anything else, the thing we really needed was RPC. That was number one. Uh, and number two was uh, just super, super fast deploys, right? Um, RPC, I don't think any of the cloud providers are providing any solution for that at all, right? Uh, and I'm kind of always wondering why, because that would be sort of the best way to tie you into a cloud provider permanently is to give them a super awesome RPC system that then is impossible to rip out of your, <laughs> of your stack. Um, so that's kind of where we started, I think, in one way, is what are we going to use for RPC? Um, and Finagle is really the only answer we came to. Sort of in parallel to that, we were looking at deployments. And this was before AWS had their, uh, was it called container ECS, Elastic Container or something like that? Um, if they had it ready, we might have just gone with that. Um, but there's all sorts of other things we wanted to build on top of it, in particular, um, like you know, stuff that, that Amazon, I think, or nobody still has. Like, you know, we wanted free develop environments, and I'll show you guys how we have that. We wanted configuration separated from uh, binaries, right? We wanted, um, you know, a nice server system that uh, is always an HTTP server, so you can always build stuff assuming you have an HTTP server around. Um, I didn't really see any of that available out there. I will show you. Uh, yes, right, S3 is up there. Um, is there anything that would take us months to rip out if we wanted to rip it out? Months? I'm hoping the answer is getting close to no. Right now, we still run a lot of stuff in AWS, and a lot of our dependencies are still in AWS because we haven't had time to pull them out. Uh, now that we've been acquired by Twitter, and one of the obvious questions constantly is, are we going to move into a Twitter data center? Right? And the answer is, someday. Right? I don't want to commit to a date. We don't have to commit to a date, fortunately. They're being nice about it. Um, but the, really, as we move more and st more stuff into Mesos and Aurora, which is happening naturally, right? users are doing it without even us asking them to do it because it's so much nicer. Uh, at some point, we were like, you know what? We could just switch, and it's going to be like zero work. Right? It'll be very, almost, almost zero work. Um, and actually, the first probably test we're going to do is we're still not using VPC because you know, we started six years ago. The VPC didn't exist. So we're in, we're in uh, AWS Classic. And uh, what I mentioned earlier about networking speeds, we really want to get up to 10 gigabit per second network speeds, and we really want to get our network variance low. Right? So if anybody's looked at the AWS network speeds, uh, inside the VPC, uh, it's crazy good compared to outside of VPC. So we're like, all right, we'd like to do that, but moving to a VPC is a huge project, and do we really want blah, blah, blah. Once you have Mesos and Aurora, it's like, well, we could probably spin up a new cluster inside of VPC, see if all the dependencies come up. Maybe they come up, and I can send it low test traffic, because, hey, I got a low test tool, right? I could verify that my cluster works in the order of a minute or two, see that the error rates look good, swap out right, my uh, uh, EOBs or whatever, and I'd probably, I'd probably be good. I thought it was in my brain. <laughs> yes? Can you talk about your use of spot instances? Oh, uh, the use of spot instances is non-existent. <laughs> it's more of a, uh, this is something we've been considering doing. And actually, I threw it on here as a, this is, it, it exists. We can use it. We don't use it yet. Um, the people really, I think, inspired me, and I want to start thinking more about using this, is the um, sale through team. When they said that they run their entire cluster on spot instances, I was like, oh, OK. We considered doing that. We thought it was too risky. Um, I said now that uh, as, as more stuff moves into this, we can start taking interesting risks uh, or start you know, experimenting with cost. Cost is actually one of the big things I think is unsolved in both Mesos and Aurora. There's no real way to specify. I mean, there's priorities, but I don't, I don't think priority is really what I want. I think what I want is an SLA saying this job um, can't be restarted more than once a day. Right, or more than once a week, or it can be restarted anytime you want, and the price of I'm willing to pay up to this much money to schedule this job. Right? With those two numbers, what it does is it makes our machine autoscaler work pretty well, because we can go, oh, I'm allowed to restart the jobs here, or 
I'm going to put these jobs on machines which in the nighttime get shut off, right? So we would sort of build a three core cluster. I want to have a cluster at the very core. We have dedicated machines. They never go away. Our database is on them, right? A second set of machines which get scaled up and down during the night, right? So this is sort of our flex capacity, right? And then I want the third layer around it to be spot instances, right? Things which will just automatically come up if people are ever willing to pay for it, right? We're not doing that yet. This is sort of forward looking. Yeah, back there. Making what? Making oh, I'm going to demo that, yeah. Uh, which, what's your preferred alcohol? So, oh, uh, whatever I can get. Um, All right, so yeah, alcoholics, I guess, don't really care about the. Uh, <laughs> yep. Yep. That's correct. Yep. We certainly do, uh, and this is this is talking from personal experience about the number of debates we have. We have a tech lead sync every week. Invariably, every single week, people say, "Are we still supporting Python? Maybe we should no longer support Python." Blah 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 blah. And we're like, "No, we're supporting Python." They're like, "Then why are you building things for Python? You're only building them for Java, right?" And we go back in the cycle. So. The answer there is we've, we kind of have this conceptual telepart server. What is telepart server? Well, really, it's just a bunch of uh, contractual obligations that you have. Um, and I've, I've labeled some of them VARs, RPCZ, FlagZ, Health, right? A telepart server is an HTTP server which exports these things. I'm actually going to demonstrate most of these, because especially like what you're saying about uh, RPCZ is really, really cool, right? It's useful. So, um, well, we built off of Twitter servers, so we're like, oh, well, when we started doing the Twitter server stuff, we get a lot of this stuff for free, and then on top of that, we just built a bunch of Java, Java stuff, right? And then suddenly, we're like, well, we want the same things in Python. Well, remember what I said earlier, as soon as you take a piece of your stack and you have two of them, or n of them, right, all your assumptions go away, right, or you have to do that much more work. So we're like, all right, well, we're going to keep the same assumptions, right, we have the same interfaces, so what we have to now do is we have to do twice as much work. Every time we implement anything in Java, we also have to implement in Python. Do we really? No. We try to you know, not be too far behind. Right? But of course, you know, as a startup, we have too much time. I mean, Google had the same problem. right? Google, in reality, for their, they were supporting, as, as primary languages, they were supporting Python, C++, and Java. Uh, Python usually was really second class because they would get uh, just the C++ libraries, right? um, which were just wrapped. So that they could run it. So whenever they build anything in C++, Python would get it, except it never quite worked exactly the same way, right? But they had to build everything twice. Um, and then what was the second part of your question? It was how do you uh, how do you convince people to move over? Uh, I'm not familiar with Node, so perhaps I'll be you know. Yeah, yeah, sure, but I'm not sure if, uh, if, if some of the things I've seen in the world will, will apply to it. But generally, I would say you have to build those layers so people are, moving, are working layers above it and don't realize that the pieces below uh, have been built or exist or whatever, right? So what we've done in Python is you know, we just went and built Docker containers which have the Python APIs, and we, um, we have a page that says this is how you create a Python service. You know, with one click, or I don't know if we made it one click yet, but you can pretty quickly have a Python service which exports all of these default things with almost no work on your end, and then you can go and happily code in Python, and you can deploy, and you can get your monitoring, and you can get your RPCZ with no work, right? How did we do that for Finagle in particular? Well, we built an open source Python version of Finagle, right? Why? Because that was it. We had to, right? There was no other solution. Um, again, we hate writing software, but we got some good people writing software, so when we have to, they do good stuff. What would we do differently? Oh, boy. Mm. What would we do differently? I don't know. Do you have your opinion? Do you have opinions on this? Hmm? No, no. I definitely don't think we nailed it. Um, I think one of, the, one of the mistakes we made uh, is the, or one of the things we sort of underestimated is the complexity of security. Um, to be fair, we didn't realize security was going to be really that important for us yet. 
uh, because you know, as a small private company, you kind of trust like everybody at the company and so on. Then uh, this slightly bigger company came around and asked to buy us, and they're like, "By the way, you have to be SOX compliant." And we're like, "Oh fuck!" <laughs> like, that's non-trivial. So we ended up hacking it away by basically making a separate Mesos cluster, which is you know now locked down using security groups, and you know, it's it's not pretty, right? It's not like the right architecture. It works. Um, but then, like now, we have this. We have a lot of debt in that particular area. Um, so, if I knew back then that we were going to get bought and blah blah blah, maybe we would have looked at it a little differently. I don't know. I don't know. Any any uh, other thoughts about that? No. All right. Demos. Other questions? Okay. Let's go into demos. So, let's see if this works. Do, 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 do. All right. Cool. <laughs> So this is our uh, Aurora cluster in East. We got two. Of course, uh, DNS and AWS is fun, so it always does that. So uh, hopefully a lot of you guys have seen the Aurora UI. We didn't build any of this. Thank you very much to other folks at Twitter who built all this because it required no work on our part. But you can see here, uh, we've got basically all of our users, all of our jobs. And what I really want to show demonstrate here is the kind of consistency you get um, as you've built up the stack, right? Like you let, uh, as you've put the foundations down. So everything here is running in Docker. Everything has a single package manager, right? Everybody who's deploying a service doesn't have to think about how to get their service there. It's basically free, okay? So let's jump into something like, oh, I know, Bitter is a nice one. This is a, so this is where most of our work actually happens, right? So we've got 1,200 cores, some terabytes of RAM and disk. So we get development environments for free. Well, what does that mean we get development environments for free? Well, let's go ahead and look at, the, at a bit of job real quick. So you guys have all seen this, hopefully in Aurora, right? So you've probably seen something like do, 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 view config. So you've probably looked at this, right? So this is what our job looks like. Well, what's going on here? Flags. This is stolen from Google. Uh, I think Twitter has the exact same thing, right? Which is all of your configuration should be passed in the binary. This is how you separate uh, binaries from configuration. So if all you need to do is change your, hmm? Make it bigger? No. All right. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, yeah, I should probably go back. I don't, think this, I don't think we have any secrets in here. We really shouldn't. A lot of variables, but they're not here. Yeah, whoa, that's not what I wanted. Come on. All right. So, um, so yeah. So the bidders are. Uh, yeah, what was I saying? Ah, yes. So all of our instances have both development and production versions. The way you do that is you sort of parameterize your uh, your downstream dependencies, right? You say, well, what am I depending on? Am I depending on prod or am I depending on devel, right? And how do you do that? Well, uh, Aurora gives you nice uh, namespaces. So really, you should just make your jobs available on both sides, and it's almost zero work. Um, what I wanted to show also here was the actual flag Z. So if you jump into an actual instance, boop, boop, boop. Oh, that's not the one. Uh, it's the admin ports, right? All right, so this is Twitter server, right? This is giving it to us for free. Um, and here you can see all the things we've registered, so we can jump into flags. If I can spell, where's flags? There it is. Right. So there you go. So there's all our flags in a slightly more readable form. Um, here you can check that everything is running under prod. Right? And if you went to the devel job, you'd see basically the same things except uh, set to devel. Um, another neat thing with flags is you could, as you can see here, allow flag mutations is true. I could go ahead and dynamically change flag values here uh, for flags that, are, that allow that. Right? So flags are, can be set as uh, enable, disable. This makes it really, really easy to debug in production, just a single task, like change, change the thing it's pointing at. So flags give you what you're pointing at downstream. Um, I talked earlier about load, right? So this is a really simple concept that we're exploring right now and that we're, uh, uh, that when you're getting a lot of servers, every server exports a load number. What that number means, that server decides, right? It can send 0 0.3, 0 0.2, it can be CPU, it can be QPS, it can be whatever it wants. Now, our autoscalers become very, very simple because all our autoscalers need to do is they just pull all of these different tasks and they just have a number saying if the average is greater than 0.8, add two tasks, that's it. 
right? So now all you sort of moved a lot of the, of the hard logic of when should I scale into the application. The application is the right place to do it because it knows most about how it should scale. And you can build, custom, you can build standard infrastructure for your, all of your clients, right? You say, we have an autoscaler, right? Same way Amazon does. All the autoscaler does is it looks at one number that you export. Oh, and by the way, we have default implementations on QPS. So really, as a runner of your new service, you give me one number. How much QPS can a task handle? 500, great, you're autoscaled. You want to do something fancy? Time of day? Go ahead, write your own algorithm, right? Just, just give me one number, right? I can autoscale you, I'm done, right? So this is something we're rolling out right now. You saw our autoscale graphs, it's going out. Uh, we can use this exact same thing for load. Right, like every service should have overload protection. Right, drop traffic if you can't handle it. Well, kind of feels like it should be the same number. Right, like if this hits 1.0 right now, it's actually misconfigured because it's 1.29, which means that we should be dropping traffic, but we're not. Um, once you hit 1.0, start dropping traffic. Right, same number, same concept, one concept applied to as many different places as possible. Right, um, then I want to show the da, 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 RPCZ. So. Here's one of the first things I asked for um, when we were building the system. I think Tony built this. Um, this is what Google had, right? It's, what is it? Every single freaking downstream thing you're talking to. Why? Because it's so freaking useful, right? How many requests am I making? How often, right? So you go like, all right, well, this is nice. I can see all of the clients I have, right? All of my request counts, the retries, right? The latencies. I can jump to a particular one. So you can see VARs is like, oh, that's interesting. Huh. Why do I have zeros everywhere except in one place? Well, this is what we were talking about earlier. We had a VARS outage, but because we were sending traffic to all of our different VARS agents, there was a huge memory blow up. Separate story. But here you can tell right away, it's like, oh, okay, it's pinned, right? We're using Finagle's pinning feature to actually talk to just a few VARS agents, right? Oh, we can jump down here and go uh, identity service, cool, everything looks good. Now, this is very useful in a distributed system when one of your downstreams is misbehaving, right? You just jump in here. Start looking at your percent success rates, see if there's anything out of the ordinary, right? Why does this work? Well, this works because every single RPC we ever make is through Finagle, right? So we built this once. All it does is listen to all the Finagle stuff outgoing, all the different things it's talking to, and it just prints this. Now, we hooked it up to our service discovery system. So look at this. I can go, oh, this one's misbehaving. Whoa, that didn't work. Hmm? There we go, right? So I just clicked on it, and this hooked me straight into uh, the identity service, right? So I could jump into this identity service, and I can see, oh, well, what's it talking to? Boop, 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 let me jump to RPCZ. Boom, all right, this one's talking to MySQL, Horcrux, Memcache, that's nice, all right? Okay, let's see how Horcrux, this is a database we built, right? You'll see, oh, these latencies, oh, I like these latencies, very nice. By the way, the P999, that's all Amazon's network, because all of our server sides are less than a millisecond, right? Oh, boom, I can just jump into one of these. And if it's time it works, suddenly I'm going to be on the next server, right? So RPCZ was really not that hard to build because we had a single RPC system, Finagle. We had a single, single uh, uh, service discovery system. And so jumping around became really easy. Sorry, I think my network's uh, booming out here. So that's RPCZ. Then you're like, all right, well, how do I get RPCZ in Python? Oh, God, we have to build it a second time, right? So let's go see, do we have it? Boop, 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 boop. So let's go up to, this is awkward, there we go. Taffy, so Taffy is our telepart front end. It's an old server running in Python. So, so far everything looks the same, right? I can jump into one of these guys. It's like, ah, oh, okay, well now it starts looking different. This is when it sucks, right? Like you don't want to make things look different because suddenly people get confused. Like why is this one different? Oh, this one's in Python, okay. Oh, I don't know how this works anymore, right? Is it the HTTP port? Oh, it's the admin port. Any one of them? Probably any one, right? There we go. All right, so this is sort of our Python version of, RPC, of, uh, our, of uh, Twitter server, right? So there you go, there's our load, right? So it's kind of the same. We have a quit, right? We have RPCZ, there we go, right? How do we build this? Well, we have to build our own Finagle client-like thing in Python, which is open source. You can go use it if you use Python and Finagle. It also supports Thrift Mux, by the way, so it's pretty fast, right? This doesn't have links yet, so we're gonna build that. But right, for developers, this is nice, because it's kind of the same. It's pretty close, right? And we're constantly making it closer and closer. Um, another thing I want to demonstrate real quick is uh, we have, I have this very important rule. Every server is an HTTP server, always, right? Why? Because it just makes development so much easier. 
So like, for example, jump into, we're, we're building a new, um, a new database on top of Redis uh, clustered on Aurora, right? So we wanted to have Redis and Aurora because we have all the spare RAM, like it's free. We could um, be saving like twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 a month if we just moved our Redis cluster into Aurora. All right, so let's do that. Um, but unfortunately, not quite supported the way we want, so we have to write a little bit of code around it. But at least we can do something really cool, which is this. It's like, all right, so I've got my Redis Sybil cluster manager here, so jump into that and go, well, everything is an HTTP server, so I have no idea how the server works, but my guess is, if I just go look at it, oh yeah, there we go. This is the smart developer, right? When he's trying to build his new service, he realizes I should, on the main page of my server, tell exactly what the service is doing, right? I can see who's the master, right? Who's a slave? For each slave, who the master is, right? So once every developer gets familiar with this, oh wait, everything is HTTP server, they start going, just making their servers easy to navigate. We call this tourism. Right? Most developers are tourists. They spend all their time in somebody else's code base, debugging somebody else's systems. Are we over time? Okay. Sorry. So that's it. I didn't realize we're over time. I'm sorry. Um, if you have any questions, come up. I can show you some other cool things we've built. But uh, thank you very much. And remember to uh, build consistent systems.